All right. We are getting started. So we are having the clubhouse join us tonight. So I got this, just got into it and decided we're going to simulcast on clubhouse and Google Meet at the same time. So we have a couple of, couple of people in there. Um, so welcome to the meetup tonight. My name is Emma Powell. We have you every month. Um, everybody go ahead and mute your, mute your microphone uh, until it's your turn to talk. Well, everybody will take turns and that way we won't have any feedback or background noise. Um, anyway, we meet every last Thursday of every month at the same time, 630, and we bring on a guest to teach us about how to invest passively. So you, if you're a passive investor, have some education there on how to vet sponsors, how to pick a deal. Uh, what what you're looking for, how to do it. And tonight, Travis is going to teach us how he lives on passive income, really like 99% of his income. Um, so I'm going to have Travis introduce himself, and then we will take some turns, go around and let everybody do a quick intro. What we're looking for is, is no more than 30 seconds with a have, what you're good at, what you can offer, and a need that you guys are looking for. All right, Travis, go for it. Cool. Thanks, Emma. Can you hear me all right? Thumbs up. All right, cool. My, my volume's a little skewed here, so sorry if I have to lean in to hear. But uh, yeah, I, I've got a presentation if you'd like for me to present. If not, I can just, whatever, just spitball it. But uh, I'm Travis Watts. Uh, I think Emma and I met maybe in 2019, late in the year, got talking about the FIRE movement, uh, financial independence, retire early, different strategies with that, and, and how... Uh, uh, real estate can play into that rather than just perhaps index funds in the stock market. So uh, what I have to offer is basically just education. I have nothing to sell anybody here. I don't have courses, programs, books, et cetera. This is just for complete value add uh, purposes. And what I'm looking for is always to network with people, to learn about different strategies, to learn what, what you have to offer. And then uh, I do work with Joe Fairless at Ashcroft Capital. So that's a accredited investor, multi-family syndication firm. So anyone interested in that, we can talk offline later. But this, this is intended just for the value add component. I know it's more than 30 seconds. Sorry, I'm done. We'll give you a little bit of extra time. I think, Travis, that was one of the things that really impressed me. I, I first kind of came across you at a, on a podcast. And at the end, your your ask was schedule a 15 minute discovery call with me. So I popped on your calendar and, and we talked. And after 15 minutes, I said, well, I better let you go. And you're like, well, I mean, we're just talking about real estate, having fun here. I was like, well, I kept at the end of the 15 minutes, I was like, where's the pitch? Where's the sign up for my coaching, sign up for my. So I finally said, I said what's your revenue model? What's the what's the reason that you're having these phone calls? And you said, um, well, my friends and family are really sick and tired of hearing me talk about real estate all the time. <laughs> and you basically um, wanted to just get it out there that your mission after retiring, really retiring, was to help the rest of us figure out how to do it too, just to lead the way. And and uh, you said you get a little perk working with uh, Joe Fairless at Ashcroft doing ambassador ships at conferences. Are you still doing that? Wow. Well, for, for what conferences are left at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, 2020 was just a lot of podcasts and actually launched a podcast during that time frame. But it's really just value add. If you go listen to that stuff, I mean, we talk about celery juice and health benefits. We talk about the fire movement. We just talk about whatever. So it's a, it's a lot of off script, um, what I consider to be value add. So. Well, I love that you are so giving of your time for those of us who are on the journey a little bit uh, behind you. So thank you. Appreciate you being here tonight. You bet. Thanks for the invite. All right. Um, I am going to take a look at everybody in the room. We've got, looks like 30 people. Um, and some of you just have phone numbers. It's in alphabetical order. So I'll just have you, I'll call, call you out and you can take your turn. Um, do we have somebody who phone number number 207? that wants to take a turn real quick to area code 217 going once going twice uh going three times uh, if you are able to hop back on let me know and we'll come back to you okay the next is area code 801 who's who's within 801 area code like everybody in here <laughs> all right 
So we're going to move on to Adrian Donner. You always get to go first because your name starts with an A. Are you here, Adrian? Oh, I'm here. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. Um, this is great. Um, I've, I'm Adrian Donner. I've been in real estate for a couple of years now and dabbled in a little of this and that and just recently um, got my real estate license so that I can do it that way. We also bought a uh, house hack last month and working on rehabbing that a little bit and it's super fun and it's going to cash flow like crazy for us. I'm excited. Awesome. Adrian's in a women's mastermind with me, so it's been fun to watch your progress over the last couple of months. Um, all right, Camouflage Man 201. Camouflage Man going once, going twice. If I skip you and you want to turn, uh, we'll definitely come back to you. Um, all right, next we've got Cricket Hepner. Cricket, you want to take a turn? All right, Cricket going once, twice, three times. Dorian, you're up next. And after that, we have Haley Alfier. Hello, everyone. My name is Dorian. I'm uh, based in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm a general partner. I do syndications. And uh, actually, my partner is Emma. That's my main partner, as long as other, as far as other partners, too. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, we've been working and in, in, in focusing here in Texas market right now. We just submitted an LOI and we are in best and final waiting for the response. Uh, hopefully we can we can get this get this done real quick. So uh, that's a little bit of what I'm doing. Yeah, and I think uh, Dorian, if, if you don't mind, I, our ask is KPs, if you have a high net worth, like, or you know somebody with high net worth, seven ten million dollar range um we would love to meet them because we have some deals that are getting a little too big for us to handle on the loan side so we're looking to partner up with some people who can help out signing on that loan so um thank you uh let's see moving on Haley alfier Haley, are you here i am hi everyone i am a newbie um i've spent the last year working the pandemic as a director of nursing I'm looking to take and start making investments. I do have six children. Um, some of them were adopted through foster care and not everyone's going to be able to support themselves. So I'm looking forward to making investments that will help to sustain my family long-term. Oh, that's awesome. I got six kids, but uh, I wish some of them were, were adopted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, either way, they're, they're the same amount of trouble, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep, I uh, now. <laughs> yeah, our, our nest is starting to empty out a little bit, so we are we're kind of on the other side of it. We're over the hill. Let's just admit it. <laughs> <laughs> for having this tonight. Well, thanks for coming, Haley, and thank you for really what you do in nursing. That sounds pretty stressful this last year. Yes. Well. Holler and let us know if there's anything we can do to help you kind of on your real estate journey, especially afterwards. We'll do some more uh, informal, just hanging out um, at uh, at the hour on at 7:30. So, um, all right. So we got Hoyan Lamb and then Jeff Coleman are next. Hoyan, do you want to take a turn? Hi, this is Hoyan. Um, sorry, I just had to unmute. Um, I'm actually from New York and I started investing in real estate about a couple of years ago and focused on single family and small um, multifamily. Um, very interested in learning more about passive income, uh, you know, passive uh, investing, syndication. Um, definitely here to network and to learn more. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for coming. All right, we got Jeff Coleman and then Jeff Helms, otherwise known as Stephanie. Oh, Jeff, we can't hear you. We're having the same problem. Which Jeff? No, Jeff Coleman. Jeff Helms, let's have you. Uh, Jeff, do you want to hop out and come back in, or do you want to just skip it? Um, up to you. So Jeff is another of my partners on my Salt Lake City project, a general contractor, and it seems like we have this problem every time we have our weekly meeting on. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it figured out. All right, Jeff Helms, you want to take take over? Sure. 
Uh, I'm Jeff Helms. I'm a realtor, full-time realtor in North Carolina. I just recently went to full-time uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, things seem to be going pretty well. Uh, I do want to invest some money later on in the summer. I've got uh, profit sharing with the company I left about a month ago. That'll be able to be taken out, but I've got to find out how to properly do that. Um, then from there, I want to um, do some syndications. Still learning as I go, but now I want to start actually networking more with people and stop putting off making the next move. So that's where I am right now. And Jeff is just, Jeff is hopeful, uh, just super giving. Uh, he's been helping me comb through my social media messages and translate all of that over into a database so that I can get my capital raising database in shape. So if you guys need anything, Jeff is, has deep experience in, in real estate in North Carolina, um, just reach out and he will, he will help you. Um, all right, next we have Jeremiah Leonard, followed by Jody Evans and Karen Lucera. So Jeremiah. Hey, hey Emma, I just wanna make sure my mic's working now. Jeff Coleman's back, yes, go ahead. All right, Jeff, how about you go and then we'll have Jeremiah go. Okay, yeah, just uh, Jeff from, uh, Live here in northern Utah, partner with Jody and Emma on this uh, Salt Lake uh, apartment deal we're working on right now. And uh, I come from a construction background, development background. I spent most of my time in with real estate in either um, single family or industrial uh, commercial. Um, so I'm a little bit new to multifamily, but uh, looking forward to getting a lot less new. Yeah, and Jeff, Jeff has been a lifesaver on this project. Having two experienced contractors in there has been awesome. So um, Jody is our other experienced contractor. Jody, you want to take a turn? Uh, Jeremiah, hop in if, if we skipped you by mistake. Go ahead, Jody. Yeah, Jody Evans. I've been a contractor for 27 years and tired of working for the homeowner and the want to be home boss basically so we're we're doing home we build homes and sell them and i just got in with emma on this and so new to it and so we're ready to rock yeah it's been awesome all right i can jump go ahead jeremiah how's it going hey jeremiah how you doing jeremiah leonard this is first time on the call um pretty new to investing as well i've been reading up on it and i've got bigger pocket on my desk right now um, and all that stuff. So I've been getting up to speed and if things go well, I'm probably going to get my first buy and hold this weekend, which would be awesome. I'm actually trying to do long distance um, from New Hampshire originally, but I'm currently living in Salt Lake City and the deal just popped up back home that it, it looks too good. So I think I'm going to jump on that. I would say my skills are I've got a lot of really good organizational skills. My W-2 job is in sales, um, and I do a lot of networking for my desk job and would love to continue that into real estate. And then I guess my ask would be if anybody has experience with deal generation or long distance specifically, like never seeing a property and then buying it, uh, that would be awesome and probably make me feel a lot better about this deal that I really think is great, but there's that disconnect of I'm not going to see it before I buy it. So that would so, be what I got. Thank you, Jeremiah. That's a perfect ask and want right there, you guys. Uh, very nice job. And Jeremiah, I can help you with um, definitely with buying out of state, sight unseen. <laughs> and it sounds like I need a little bit of your networking organization in my life because I love networking. I'm not so great at the organizing the follow-up part. So appreciate you being here tonight. Awesome. We'll definitely have to connect. All right. Um, we've got Karen Lucero and Kenny Ingersoll next. Karen, you want to introduce yourself? All right, Karen, going once, going twice. Wait, sorry. There she is. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize I turned everything off. Anyway, okay. So, yeah, Karen Lucero. I'm um, pretty excited. I just. Uh, I'm an LP on a deal in Dallas and I am a co-sponsor in a deal in Houston. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I started looking at this seriously probably just four months ago and uh, super excited with everything I've learned. 
and I'm looking, I'm uh, pretty excited to jump into more deals. Um, I'd like to be a partner or to keep learning, see how the back end of these um, syndications run, figure out how to find properties, or I just like working with people more than anything. Um, we are able to sign on loans. Uh, we do have some cash and investments to deploy still, and I'm excited to see what happens with the seeds we planted so far. Um, and I look forward to working with everybody, and learning, continue to learn. Yeah, Karen, uh, our friend, mutual friend in Texas introduced us a couple of months back and your progress that you've made just the past couple of months going from, from I, I'm so excited for your, for your Houston deal, especially because that'll be your first general partner. Yeah, it's a, it was going to give my husband a heart attack, but he <laughs> All right, just don't even tell me about it anymore. Just do it. And it's not like you gotta handle on it. So hopefully I don't get kicked out of the house. Yeah. I, I put about this almost the same amount of money into my first deal as you did. And man, we were all having strokes the whole time. Like it was it was tough. So uh, well, but it, it was my entire pile and it's it's not your entire pile, so that you're doing it smarter than I did. <laughs> well, I tried to leave no stone unturned and I I'm trying to go into it with wide, eyes wide open and educated. So yeah. yep. I, if they screw it up, I really totally missed. <laughs> <laughs> they won't screw it up. You got a good group. Um, yeah. okay. So Kenny Ingersoll. So when I call your name, um, just be ready to unmute so we can, we can be quick, quick through this. Uh, Kenny Ingersoll followed by Lisa Lau. Hey everyone, I'm Kenny Ingersoll. I'm living magnet just outside Salt Lake. I've got into real estate a couple months ago and trying to jump in off the deep end as much as can, looking to learn as much as I can and grow as fast and hopefully I'm getting a deal hopefully in the next month or two and looking to connect with um, operators that have the experience and backing and that we can form some sort of uh, partnership and make things happen. Nice. Thank you, Kenny. I, we met a couple of months ago. You took me to my first time eating at In-N-Out Burger. It was good. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lisa, go for it. Hey, I'm uh, Lisa Lau, and I just started going to real estate since October, and I'm actually gonna close my first deal in a couple of weeks, I hope, so it's a fourplex, I'm excited. Um, my background, I've, uh, I own a coffee shop, so I understand a lot around finance. Also, my um, day job is a uh, marketing, so I do a lot of market analysis and product portfolio management. And what I hope to get, and what I've already gotten so far with the Emma's a passive uh, income Facebook group, I've uh, have a coach, and and I met with a couple already, and uh, meeting and uh, and learning through uh, through the group. So it's been good so far. So Lisa is our friendly passive income group moderator. So do not cross her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got M57, Maria Sperano, and Melody Lai are next. So M57, you want to take a turn? Followed by Maria and Melody. Hey, guys. Um, my name is Mitch. I'm a foreman for a commercial furniture company. Um, I just barely joined the meetup this week, and I saw the little description for what Travis had to say, so... Tired of working out in the field and being on the bus, so hopefully I can take some money I have in pocket and try and make it work for me. So that's why I joined. That's how you do it. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Mitch. All right. We got Maria, Melody, and then Michael Hadris. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Maria Sperano. I'm from uh, White Plains, New York. Currently, I work as a tax associate in, for one of the bigger public accounting firms. I don't specialize in real estate, but I have a lot of knowledge because I have worked on a lot of like partnerships and individuals that specialize in real estate. Uh, so if anybody needs help with any uh, tax advice, please let me know, I'm happy to help. Uh, I met Travis in the summer. I don't know if he remembers, but we had a call, th that 15 minute call, and uh, he helped me a lot with the first syndication deal that I did. He referred me to a self-directed custodian and I was able to go to that. I was able to uh, invest as a LP using my husband's self-directed IRA. Uh, we invested in a deal in Georgia and we closed, I think it was sometime uh, late in December. Uh, for this year, my, my biggest goal is to um, 
do a house hack. So if anybody that has done house hack would like to connect with me and uh, share some of their experience, I'll be very thankful for that. And my and potentially invest in a fund this year. But my long term goal is to become Travis one day. Yeah, in like ten years from now, hopefully. Me too. Yep. <laughs> All right. So. Be paying attention to what people are saying, what they're good at or what they need, because afterwards you can make sure that you guys hook up um, because not everybody is going to have something that you need or something that you want, but kind of make a mental note of who's doing something that you need to be doing and, and vice versa. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we've got Melody Lai is next, followed by Michael Hadris and then Natalia Linchenko. Melody. All right, once, twice, let's move on to Michael. Uh, if you want to hop in, if we skip you, uh, you can hop in. Uh, we'll come back if you want. Sure, can you hear me? Hi, there you are, Michael. Oh, great. I'm, I turn on my camera, but I can't see myself. But uh, okay. yeah, Mike, uh, I'm, on, I'm in San Diego. Um, the last 14 years, I've been a commercial appraiser and um, the last eight of my own firm. Um, been investing the last two years uh, personally with my wife and um, we have three syndications that we've done LPs in, and um, back in October, we closed uh, as a joint venture with two other partners on a 50 unit in Indianapolis. Nice. So uh, I'm just looking to, I guess my skill sets is underwriting. I have really good fundamentals on, on how to do it, and um, I've done it many times. So um, I'm also looking just to partner or JV on, on future deals. All right. Underwriting, you guys, that's how I got my first partner and my first deal done is somebody volunteered to help me with underwriting and then I ended up partnering up with them. So remember that right there. <laughs> that's something I need. Um, all right, Natalia Linchenko and then Palma Talancon and Rob Velasco. Okay, hi guys, I'm Natalia Linchenko. Um, I actually haven't met you yet, Emma. I'm kind of just her fangirl. I heard her on Bigger Pockets <laughs> and then found her nephew, who we've become really good friends and have been stock talking real estate. So, my stage right now is I'm kind of just jumping into everything and deciding what I love. I have a rental, I'm working in flips, and now I'm studying real estate to get my license. And so, what I'm looking for most is mentorship and accountability. And then, what I have to offer, I've been in marketing, communications, social media organizational skills and I also am at a stage of life where I'm very free I don't have kids I'm not married I'm young have a lot of energy so um just if anybody needs anything I'm just down to do whatever I don't care about dirty work sending your mail I'm just here for the long game and fine taking the the dirty route route, route to get there I guess so yeah thanks so much for having me Emma you're like the opposite of all the rest of us young and have a lot of it's like energy <laughs> i miss i miss figure i won't have it forever so i have to use it while while it's here there you go we need to go get some lunch one of these days it's, it's yeah that. i'd love that about time we meet each other in person Definitely. Um, all right thank you for coming uh next we got palma talencon rob velasco Hello. and rob howell hi so this is my first meeting that i'm coming to i'm out in the chicagoland area and um, I have purchased three single family homes in the Memphis area and through a turnkey company. And it actually worked out really well so far. Um, I want to, I want to get enough rentals that will help me pay and help me retire so that I can not have to work anymore. Um, and I don't have a lot of retirement money already, you know, set aside. So this is going to help me do that. So that's what I have. Um, basically, I'm here to learn. I don't know a lot of these link, these words that you guys are using. <laughs> I don't even understand them. So hopefully I'll get something out of it. But thanks. Yep. Palm and I met three years ago when we very, both of us were first starting our real estate journey, newbies. I've been trying to talk her into this uh, commercial syndication stuff for a while. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'm one of those analysis paralysis people. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I'll push you off a cliff. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we got Rob Velasco, Robert Howell, followed by Rusty Pollard. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. You 
Go for it. Hi, uh, I'm Rob. I'm from Chicago. I just started passive investing uh, last summer. Just here to learn and network with people and hope to be financially free someday soon. I hate working, so I value my time. So that's it. Nice. All right. Thanks, Rob. We've got uh, Rob Howell. I see you're unmuted. And then Rusty Pollard, followed by Ryan Hutchison, my nephew. Hi, guys. I'm uh, Rob Howell from mid New Jersey. Um, I became a real estate agent about a year ago. Um, and last year was kind of difficult because my other job was more or less full time and it got even busier. Um, I, w I work with a lot of kids and the parents couldn't wait to get the kids outside so I was just getting sessions after sessions after sessions I became an agent but didn't really do much with it um, I just got qualified for a mortgage uh, but unfortunately where I live the, the properties are really expensive so I'm looking in upstate New York uh, I've just managed to find um, a good agent or fingers crossed they're a good agent who's uh, looking for properties in upstate New York, and they just put me on to uh, a mortgage advisor who just got me qualified for a mortgage um, with some, uh, he apparently had to do some work on his side because my, my income's more like a 1099, so it's not a W-2. Um, so fingers crossed, uh, I can get my first property in upstate New York with a few units, and hopefully it'll all uh, snowball from there. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, reach out to me. I have some people in New Jersey that you need to meet. Some pretty, right. some pretty awesome investors out there. So, Thank you. Um, all right. So next we have Rusty Pollard, Ryan Hutchison, and Sean Baxter. Thirty seconds. A uh, quick intro, intro with your haves and wants. Hey guys, I'm Rusty. Um, I am a multifamily investor, so I've done small stuff, big stuff, some creative stuff. I'm actually down in a hotel in Key West right now for a mastermind event, so having some fun. Um, I, I, I've got a background in facilities and construction, so as far as asset management, underwriting, that kind of stuff, that's kind of my strength. So I'm happy to chat with you guys as far as that goes. Um, I'm just looking to you know, through this group and through my mastermind and all that, um, just pick up those those extra few things uh, as far as making more deals pencil. So I'm fairly conservative and fairly conventional in my underwriting and, and that whole process. So I'm just looking to get more creative. Awesome. Thank you. I'll be down in Key West at a mastermind. Are you petting me <laughs> on camera? <laughs> Love you. Bye. Are, you, are you heading home? Yeah. All right. We're, uh, we're at our new house, the, the, our house hacking house that we just bought. Oh yeah. So we got our internet hooked up. We got our sofas over here and uh, we even got our bed over here, but he's going home to sleep in the other bed. Um, anyway, kind of cool new adventure, new adventure for us. We're turning our old house into an assisted living because Travis, we'll get to that later. <laughs> We're having a cash flow crisis on the whole passive income thing. So, um, all right. So next we got Ryan Hutchison and then we got on Clubhouse, we've got Sachin. Sachin, if you want to take a turn, uh, you just go ahead and unmute yourself, and I'll, I'll pop you on. So let's start with uh, Ryan Hutchison. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a software engineer for my day job, and so I do lots of coding. Um, I'm currently building an email marketing tool in my free time to uh, for like a side hustle. So I've got a few clients on that, bringing in some kind of passive income. Um, I recently bought my first house, so I'm house hacking that to get my mortgage paid for for me. Um, and I'm looking to diversify and get into real estate. Uh, I am looking for someone who I can shadow and someone I can learn as much as I can from. I'll do almost anything and I can offer doing anything you need. Um, I've got lots of energy all the time in the world. i uh, got a lot of marketing experience and software as well. And he, he means it too. Like he did a ton of work for me when I very first started and, and he and Natalia are are energetic. So he helped me a ton with like social media marketing and just some of the grunt work that, that needed to get done. So reach out. He's, he's very, he's talented that way. And, and he will actually do what he says he's going to do. That's mm -hmm. right. My nephew, Ryan, he lives around, his mom lives around the corner for me. Um, not anymore now that we moved here. <laughs> All right. Sachin, if you want a, a turn, just uh, hop in and then uh, Sean Baxter and Tina O'Hanley will, will uh, round it out. Sean, 
go for it. And then Tina after you. Okay, looks like we're skipping Sean. Tina, go ahead. Hi, Tina here. I'm calling in Spain. I'm a newbie. I own a real estate pharmacist for 15 years. A uh, lot is in my 401k. I'm now trying to get a taxable account that I'm definitely looking past it. Probably turnkey time is I do not have a very Okay, thanks, Tina. You broke up a little bit there, but I think I got most of it. Um, pharmacist looking to do some passive, maybe turnkey. So, um, Palma, maybe you and Tina should compare notes. Um, all right, Sean, go for it. Um, I'm Sean Baxter. I'm in the Salt Lake, Northern Salt Lake area. Um, I've been in construction my whole life, cabinetry for the last 18 years. I've done single family flips. I'm looking to do uh tennessee i'm looking for short-term rentals right now in the cabin area up in the pigeon forge area i'm also house i'm ready to house hack a, either a big house so i can do assisted living or multi-family or anything i can get my hands on at the moment um so i'm willing to help with any type of uh, handyman stuff too if anybody's in need or knowledge that way I've had my uh, single family rentals for quite a while but I'm looking to get more so always willing to help and Sean what city are you in again um, I'm in northern Utah okay. I'm up Davis County area oh okay I'm just just north of Salt Lake okay yeah because I thought you were in Salt Lake but um, you yeah, said northern I'm, Utah thinking like Logan yeah. Oh no, just just barely north. Okay, I, mean, I should have been home, but I just drove up from St. George, so I didn't get home in time. So I'm sitting no. in the car. Well, give me a holler. I have some stuff that we need done handyman wise. But I have another nephew who's a handyman at local, and he's he's just booked up until like March. So let me know. Um, <laughs> Sounds like the rest of us. I know it's bad. <laughs> yeah. um, so so if anybody's got any type of off market deal that I can. I'm pre-approved everywhere, so I'm just been throwing offers out left and right. So I'm just ready to house hack anything I can at the moment. I just got done with one, and I've moved out of that and rented it out. So now I'm ready for the next one. All right, thank you, Sean. So, yep, thank you. We need to meet in person one of these days too. It's been it's like we keep not. It's been months. Like let's go get some lunch. <laughs> Sounds great. We'll do it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Like I said, um, mark down the names of the people that you want to connect with outside of this afterwards. Are you working on some of the same projects or they do something you need advice on and vice versa. Um, and then Travis, let's have you pop back in, um, give you the floor. Um, if you want to share your presentation, Travis, you just click the present now button and choose which window you want and it'll, it'll uh, pull up your, your, your deck. All right, cool. Let's see. Is that full screen for you? Yep, works for me. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. That was actually really helpful. This is the first meetup I've spoken to where, where we had that introductory session. That helps me a lot. I actually switched up the presentation I was going to do tonight uh, to something different. A, a little bit shorter, and then B, a little bit more focused on active and passive, even though it's called passive investing. Uh, there's some additional slides that we can cover in here. So I think this will be really good. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, if you know me, you know that my biggest thing is the value of our time. You know, So the fact that everybody is here uh, on a Thursday night is highly appreciated. Uh, from me. So thank you so much for that. And what I want to go through, uh, let me ask you this, Emma, real quick. We have like, what, 30 minutes? What, what's the idea here? Yeah, about, I would say about 30 minutes. Um, okay. And then afterwards, anybody who wants to stay and, and chat some more and network um, is, is free to say, we'll probably stay here for about another, right until about eight o'clock on the hour. But uh, you have about, you know, 30 minutes or however long you want to take. Like okay, you said. cool. Well, I will maximize that time. I uh, promise to only add value. So <laughs> I'll skip through anything that's not adding value in this particular presentation. So 
bear with me. I set a timer and um, and thanks again, everybody. So Travis Watts, a couple disclaimers real quick. We're this is not a general solicitation, as I pointed out. This is solely just value to everybody listening. We're not talking about deals or securities, or I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not giving you any advice. This is educational purposes in this presentation, my points of view, my opinions. Uh, excuse the, the the cheesy little infographic thing there. But uh, so I'm a full-time investor. Um, sometimes I refer to myself as a full-time passive investor. Uh, meaning that I'm a limited partner and every investment I have in my whole portfolio is not anything anymore that requires uh, my time after I make that initial investment. I'm director of investor relations with Ashcroft Capital. We're New York City based. We do multifamily deals in the B class sector, mostly in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth area, also out in Florida. And now um, we actually just, just launched a deal today in Georgia. So we're opening up to some new markets there. Uh, I was active in single family homes from 2009 to 2015 while I was balancing an oil field job. So I had a W-2. I worked 100 hours a week. I was always out of state. I was always away from home. I worked in, in Saudi Arabia uh, overseas. And so it was just really tough for me personally, given that kind of uh, role <laughs> to try to scale up a single family portfolio. You know, after I got to, you know, six, seven, eight properties, it, it, I could see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel closing in, so to speak. And so I transitioned in 2015 to passive multifamily syndications. And that is all I have done since. Well, I shouldn't say that's all I've done. That's about 80% of what I do in my portfolio anything in that 20% category would be like uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts, ATM investing, self-storage, uh, note lending, hard money lending, stuff like that. So it's anything that's going to have a cash flow focus because as Emma pointed out, I, I live on cash flow. That's kind of the, the name of my game. So once I left the oil field, that was really what I, I wanted to do in order to free up my time and kind of get my life back, so to speak. So that's about 12 years in real estate. And at the end of the day, uh, what I offer to folks is just, you know, I have a passion for helping people understand real estate. Uh, I did the house hacking, by the way. I, I did fix and flips. I did vacation rentals. That was kind of the progression up until 2015 uh, where I went into these, these syndication deals. And we'll get more into kind of why and how that works. So the agenda... Uh, that I propose, bear with me, I haven't even previewed all of these. This is a presentation I actually never did. So uh, we're gonna talk self-awareness, strengths and weaknesses and how to play to those, how to identify investing criteria. Then we'll get really into the meat of active and passive investing, kind of the pros and cons. Then single family and multifamily, kind of same thing, pros and cons. And then I'll share with you what strategy I used uh, to kind of go from being full-time active to full-time passive. Whether or not that's your ultimate goal, I think everybody on this call would agree that we would all like to have uh, a little more passive income, either A, now, or B, later. So why not start learning it now? That's kind of <laughs> the point of this presentation. So bouncing into self-awareness, staying on track with time, I'll try to skip through this here as quickly as I can. So there's there's two types of investors in my mind, right? There's your, your passive investors, which is what I am now, and then your active investors. These are gonna be generalizations of someone that may identify with the personality type of a passive investor. So you may lack the time to frequently monitor your investments. This was definitely my situation as I was working in the oil industry. I just didn't have the time to be using up all my days off searching for properties and you know uh, knocking on people's doors and building relationships with, with brokers and realtors and managing my tenants. It was just too much. But I did enjoy reading financial news, keeping up with migration trends and the economy and the Fed and interest rates. And that's always been of interest to me my whole life, really, uh, as long as I can remember. And then maybe you lack, um, oh, I'm sorry, you, you, you like a little bit of diversification. That's something that you value. That's something that really got me paranoid 
as I had all these single family homes out in Colorado, it was between Fort Collins and Denver for anybody familiar, that's about a 50 mile radius. I had all my net worth there, all of my properties there, same asset class, same geography, same state. So I got a little paranoid about not feeling diversified after a while. And so you may seek to match, but not necessarily beat the market, right? So whether we're talking real estate or stocks, this would be the, the person who's, you know, buying an index fund in the stock market, right? You, you want to participate in any potential equity upside, but yet you're not thinking, well, I can beat it. I'm going to day trade stocks or something like that. So to that point, your active investors, they enjoy, this is the key point right here, enjoys being in the business of real estate. This was the hard conversation I had to have with myself, looking in the mirror and thinking, I'm not a handyman, I don't have the connections, I can't do this very well, this is not my strength, this is really not my highest and best, so to speak. But that doesn't mean it's not right for you, This was, I'm just sharing my story with you. Um, and you may not devalue, uh, value diversification as a top priority, meaning you may specialize in a particular market or a sub-market, and that's where you were born and raised and you got all the connections in the world out there, and so that may not be as big of a deal if you're gonna be on the active side. And you may seek control over your investments. You wanna make the calls, you wanna make the choices, you wanna you know, do your own business plan and you wanna decide when to sell. Certainly attributes of an, of an active investor. And then basically you may have an advantage over the competition and that would be huge because see, I didn't. As Even though I was doing these flips and vacation rentals, I was, I, it was amateur hour, let's be frank. <laughs> You know, so I was going through the motions, but not not very efficiently. And you know, you may seek to beat the market. You may say, "Yeah, all these other people are doing these things, but but I could do it better." You know, I could do it my way. Maybe so. So that would be more of an active investor. And you may be a combination of the two. I know plenty of folks who are GPs, co GPs, etc., but also doing LP deals and vice versa. So. Let's talk a little bit, let's shift gears really quickly. And I wanna cover investment criteria. Anyone that's listened to uh, podcasts that I've done or, or my own podcast knows I always talk about knowing your criteria. It's so important to uh, not get caught up in analysis paralysis like I heard earlier uh, somebody mention. So there's obviously all these sectors that we can be in as investors. We could specialize in multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks, office, hotel, retail. I mean, it goes on. I mean, senior living, et cetera. But we, we need to kind of hone in and decide whether we're going to be a passive investor or active, what our specialty niche is really going to be. That's part of your criteria. Uh, Equally important, what strategy? Just because you're in multifamily, it's not created equal. As much as the headlines like to suggest that all multifamilies either up, down, sideways, or whatever. <laughs> you could be a new development, new construction, value add, putting a facelift on properties, opportunistic, taking something that's highly distressed or has some significant issues and bringing it back to life, buy and hold for the long term, Fix and flips, the burr strategy, which is uh, what is it? Buy, buy, rehab, refinance, repeat, something like that. I've done all of this except new development. Never touch that. But again, honing in is is the key. Not trying to do it all. And then criteria. Probably should have thought of a better term for that. But basically, monthly or quarterly distributions. Uh, obviously, a lot of new development would have no distributions for several years, uh, probably. Uh, cash flow or equity. What are you most interested in? Are you trying to build up a big nest egg and then later you're gonna, you're gonna make that passive potentially? Or are you like me where you're looking for cash flow now today because you wanna live on it and you wanna be financially free now or sooner? Uh, REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. Uh, I'm referring to a publicly traded REIT in the stock market versus a private syndication. You know, What's your preference? Pros and cons to both. We'll talk about that in a bit. A class, B class, C class, D class properties, big differences, knowing the difference between new construction and luxury housing to C class 1970s building that hadn't been renovated in 20 years, big differences in business plays. Uh, are you into the urban? Are you into the suburban, you know, in the outskirts of big cities, the Sunbelt regions, Northern regions? Here's the point, it's not to overwhelm you, 
anyone who wants to take a snapshot of this, go ahead and do so. And uh, if you need these slides afterwards, by the way, I'm happy to email them to anybody. But here's the point right here. Identify your criteria. I'm sharing with you right now what my criteria is. That doesn't mean that it's right for you or anybody else, but you need to get clear. I love multifamily. I really like value add. I'm a buy and hold investor, at least for a five year term, possibly longer. Some deals are indefinite that I have. I like monthly distributions. Why? Well, I live on it. Do I want to be paid once a quarter, once a month? I like monthly. Uh, I'm cash flow focused, same reasons. I like syndications, less volatility, more consistent. I like knowing uh, who I'm working with and partnering with people face to face. I can't go get you know Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple on the phone and ask him what he's up to and why he's making these decisions. Uh, B and C class property, uh, affordable housing is the term I use. That's probably not the correct term anymore to use, but what I mean is you know, a thousand bucks a month, two bed, two bath unit. Most people in America can afford that kind of rent. That's where I like to be. Uh, the suburbs, mostly, sometimes urban, it really depends. And the Sunbelt regions, you know, Texas, uh, Florida, big fan of Arizona, Georgia, even the Carolinas, you know, are, are some of my favorite markets anyway. So it's just getting clear because as a full-time LP, I get sent hundreds of deals per year and it can be really tough to, to read between the lines and decide what's a good deal, what's a bad deal. But if I know this, I can eliminate 90% of what gets sent to me and it makes it a lot easier to make decisions. And you need to be able to explain all of this to your investors if you're gonna be on the active side of this business. All right, switching gears once more to active and passive. Um, so with active, uh, I, I think this is pretty clear to everyone, but I just wanna cover some, some real quick examples of being a hands-on type of investor. You're, you're gonna be doing fix and flips, vacation rentals, wholesaling, maybe you're a general partner, or a co-GP in a syndication. This is active investing. Whereas a hands-off investor like myself would be a limited partner in the syndication, maybe buying REITs on the stock market, note lending, high dividend yield stocks, tax liens. I mentioned ATM machines earlier. It's all passive business models. Nothing I do requires my time after vetting the deal, the team, the market, making it a decision to invest. Shameless plug, I have the Actively Passive show on YouTube with Theo Hicks. It's under the, the best ever brand with Joe Fairless, but uh, I actually didn't know that that was in there. But anyway, tune in. We talk off script about real estate, fire movement, all kinds of stuff, as I mentioned earlier. All right, single family. Uh, I, this is the slide I was thinking of when I was listening to, to all of you speak about what you're looking for. I just wanna cover the pros and the cons from my perspective. Um, because I did this, you know, equal time really, right? I did this for about six years and now six years in multifamily. So why not cover kind of the experience of both? And I'll try not to have a extreme bias for you. How about that? So the pros would be you have control. You're making the shots uh, or calling the shots rather, finding your own properties. Usually it's local. A lot of people like where they live. And so it's nice to do things in your own backyard, so to speak, potentially higher returns. Why? Well, because you're putting in the work, so you should get compensated more than if you didn't have to put in any work, right? Pretty simple. Uh, you can be creative. You can buy something, as Emma mentioned, you can buy a property, house hack it, turn it into a vacation rental. Later, you can move in and make it your owner occupied house. Very cool. You can change up strategies with real estate. It's one reason I love real estate uh, to the point of changing strategies. Some of the cons that I ran into is, you know, it requires a lot of time. It's all fun and games on property one, two, three, and four. And then eventually lending gets tougher, management gets tougher, property managers start pulling, you know, a lot of money in. And it's harder to make the returns, even though you're putting in a lot of time and effort. And, you know, my, my goal way back when in 2009 would have been, I want 50 single family homes or 100 and not even 20% of the way there. And I was, I was burning myself out hard. And so it was difficult for me to scale. Doesn't mean you can't do it. There's certainly people that have 100 single family homes. It's possible. But for me, that was really hard with the W-2. Recourse loans means the bank is, is lending to you. They're looking at your credit, your debt to income ratio. You're responsible for that loan. And the bank's going to come after you and your assets in most cases when you're doing a single family rental. Um, 
And when I say lack of diversification, you can have multiple properties, but like I mentioned, all of mine were within a 50 mile radius up and down the front range of Colorado. So I wouldn't necessarily call that diversification when all I had was single family houses in a 50 mile radius doing the same business model, all managed by myself or, or a property management team. So again, you may or may not value that. Uh, and then the value is based on comps. This is one thing I really had to take a hard look at is 2008, 2009, 2010, I was buying in 09 and the market hadn't even bottomed yet, but it sucks when you think about, you could have a great single family home with a great renter who's always paid rent on time, who's paying above market rent, but yet when you go to sell your house, none of that really matters because the comps around you are what determine the value of that house. It's not about your renter that's in place for the most part. And so that would be um, a, a con. And so we'll talk about multifamily and how this stacks up. So the, the pros are hands off and passive, at least to a point, right? You still have to get to know these teams and operators, learn how to bet deals, make decisions, wire money, this kind of stuff, uh, signing docs, whatnot. But after I make an investment, I'm pretty much hands off for the next three to seven years, depending on the business plan. Very scalable. I had a couple mentors. I'm very fortunate to have had couple guys I met out of a real estate group in Colorado in their 60s and 70s who've done over 100 LP deals. Well, much more than that now, but at the time. And, and a lot of that was what I do today. And so them being open and honest with me and saying, here's my portfolio. This is how it's been for like 20 years. These are the results. Gave me a lot of confidence to, to look into this more seriously. And you get to leverage other people. As I mentioned, I wasn't good in, in real estate when I was doing things actively. So I get to leverage the experts who are good, who are passionate about being in the business of real estate. That certainly wasn't me. And then diversification. I've got these LP deals, the limited partnership interest in all kinds of multifamily through all, I don't even know how many states I'm invested in. It's crazy. But I love it because, you know, whatever, if I got a deal in Tampa and some hurricane comes and wipes it out, well, I got a lot of Dallas properties. And if a tornado hits those, I got Colorado properties. And if a blizzard hits those, I got Ohio properties. And so I, I really like it. I'm, I'm passionate about diversifying. So um, anyway, you may or may not resonate with that. But and, and then the last pro here, uh, and there's many more, but I just put a couple of bullet points is that the value is based on the net operating income. So unlike, I mean, comps certainly are a consideration, don't get me wrong, but at the end of the day, if you've got a multifamily property that's pumping out a million bucks a year in cash flow, and then you're able to increase it to 1.2, you literally just made millions of dollars in value because somebody's looking at like a 10X multiple of that net operating income when they go to buy that property. So I, I don't have a detailed slide on how exactly that works, but just know that the name of the game is cutting expenses that are inefficient and then raising rents and other revenue generating items on multifamily. That's the name of the game when you're doing multifamily, active or passive. Some of the cons are you don't have direct control. I am exchanging diversification uh, you know, for, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting diversification in exchange for making decisions. So I'm putting my faith and trust into somebody else, into a partnership team who has a track record of doing this. And I don't, I don't get to make those decisions on what happens to these properties. Usually not local, got a couple deals in, in Florida and Colorado where I'm from, but most aren't. Most are in Texas and places I've never lived. Some accreditation uh, requirements for those not familiar, High net worth, high income could be a threshold or a barrier of entry to get into an apartment syndication. And they're illiquid. A lot of these are three years, five years, seven years, as I spoke about earlier. And you don't just get your money back like in a REIT where I buy it today and tomorrow I decide I want to sell. I can't do that. I put in 50 grand into one of these things and the money is, is, is used. It's going towards a down payment and a rehab budget and it's being spent. And so these are illiquid shares without a public uh, market to exchange from. So it's not that you can't get out of them, but it's, it's certainly not easy to do so. So just recognize that whether that's right or wrong for you. 
And then the last thing is that it usually requires a relationship to invest. You want to know who you're investing with. You want to have conversations with them. Uh, I see that as a good thing. But if you're an introverted person or you don't like networking or you don't want to meet people, which I'm sure is nobody on this call, but uh, just, just know that uh, that's kind of a requirement, unlike a stock that you could just do, you know, in, in your basement on your computer, so to speak. So switching gears one last time, we're wrapping up towards the end. I think I'm on track. Yeah, we're looking really good. Um, I want to share with you guys a strategy. This gets back to what I spoke about when Emma and I first um, were networking in 2019. We really hit it off on the fire movement element. We were talking about documentaries and audio books and philosophy of financial independence, retire early, which gets some criticism based on the RE, the retire early. A lot of people saying, you know, what the hell are you going to do with your time if you're retired in your 30s, right? You got to do something. You got you to keep working. So I would say eliminate the RE and focus on the FI. It's all about financial independence and what you want to do with your time. It's really about that flexibility that you have. It's about options. Maybe you work full time now and you want to work part time. Maybe you want to pivot careers and try something else because you don't enjoy what you're doing. And this cash flow can give you a backstop. Maybe you do want to retire early. You know, maybe you just want to spend more time with, with kids and family. Maybe you want to travel. Maybe you want to be more charitable, spend more time with, with church or, or launching a charity. Everybody's different. But like I said earlier, I think we could all agree that cash flow, uh, we could all use some more cash flow. Why not? So here's the four step strategy that I personally used that you can apply as well uh, if you're looking to go kind of active to passive or retire in general. Let's just put it that way. Number one, earn as much income as you can using your highest and best. For some people, that's Dr. Dennis, lawyer, attorney, whatever you went to school for. Other people, it's being a business owner. I put in here, uh, for me anyway, I had a high paying job, which was the oil field. I did active real estate investing, flips, vacation rentals, buy and holds, et cetera, house hacking. And then I had side businesses. Uh, I owned a clothing line at one point. I, I rented out audio equipment, which is actually what I went to school for was kind of live show production, um, believe it or not. And uh, so that was my highest and best uh, earning potential the way I saw it. Number two, live on as little of that income as possible, but only for a certain time frame. This is the caveat. I don't, I don't recommend people just live severely below their means till the day they die. That's no life to live. So five to 10 years is kind of a time frame I put in here as a general guide. Uh, maintain a high savings rate for five or 10 years. Um, <laughs> hashtag fire movement. That's, that's what it's all about. Number three is invest the difference in what you're earning and what you're living on I would say into real estate. I don't care what you guys do in real estate, if it's house hacking, if it's buy and holds, if it's fix and flips, if it's wholesale, whatever. Put it into real estate because in the traditional fire movement, everyone's dumping everything into index funds in the stock market. There's relatively no cash flow to that. I think the S&P index has like a 1.5% dividend yield annually. So that's as bad as, that's not much better than putting your money in the bank basically. So put into real estate, ideally assets that produce a combination of cash flow and have equity upside, which is kind of that value add or opportunistic or, you know, could be new development. I'm not bashing any strategy, but just generally speaking, that's it. And then avoid bad debt. If you've got credit card loans, you know, car loans, student loans, personal loans, et cetera, just pay off the debt as soon as you can. That, that's such a huge crisis that we have right now with student loan debt and just consumer debt in our country. And it holds so many people back from just getting started, being able to invest at their highest potential. So there you have it. I know that seems maybe like somewhat common sense and I'll put it this way. It's simple, but it's not easy, but it's really that simple <laughs> as far as a formula to, to wealth or financial independence. That's the answer, uh, at least from, from my vantage point. That's what's worked. And not just for me, for a lot of people, for thousands of people, especially those in, in this fire movement. So final thoughts. I love this quote, uh, Tony Robbins. Most people 
overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. This can't, couldn't be more true, right? I, I think we're all guilty sometimes of setting those uh, maybe unrealistic goals for uh, you know, one year, right? I want to make a million bucks this year. I want to double my income. I want to have, I'm going to go buy 10 properties this year. But then the reality is, you know, you buy three or four properties or you get a 10% pay increase or whatever. But if you just stretch that out a little more, uh, I think we can we can really achieve a lot over a 10 year time frame. So set some realistic goals and go for it is, is are my final thoughts. So Emma, we can do, um, a Q and A, we can move into networking, but here's here's the thing, as I promised, I have nothing to sell you guys. Connect with me, whether it's here, whether it's on Instagram and Facebook at Passive Investor Tips. I do a blog on Bigger Pockets. I'm on LinkedIn very actively. I've got the Actively Passive show on YouTube. Um, that's my calendar link uh, that Emma was referring to that I open up to the world. If you wanna hop on a one-on-one, -on -one, whether that's Zoom or phone, 15 minutes, I'll give you my time. We'll talk about anything you wanna talk about and I'll add value there uh, with no upsell, that's my promise. And I also have a PDF guide, it's called Understanding Real Estate Private Placements. Uh, we only hit the surface level on that. So this is if you wanna dive a lot deeper. So that's my last slide. Thank you guys for tuning in. And Emma, you tell me kind of how you wanna proceed from here. I'd love to do some Q&A and we kind of mix in some networking with that. And then, um, yeah. like I said, the room will stay open until about eight for those who want to stay and mingle. Um, I, okay, so this is the question that I've been thinking about ever since that we talked and I haven't okay. had a chance to ask you. We do have a couple that were posted in advance on Facebook that I'll read as well. But um, anybody, you know, jump in when you're ready. Um, so when you very first just said, you know, this is too hard, this is taking up too much time, I want to be financial independent, location, freedom. Um, and you first were like, I'm quitting on this passive income, quitting my job. Um, I always imagine that's gonna be like lean fire where you quit and you just don't have any money. You're like just beans and rice, Dave Ramsey lifestyle. Um, can you tell us at what point you decided you were ready to jump ship and felt comfortable that you had enough coming in and that it was gonna be reliable for the long term? Sure, yeah. So let's talk first about kind of the, the reliability or what gives somebody the confidence to move forward with the decision, right? Well, for me, it came from two things. The mentors that I mentioned who were in their 60s and 70s who had been doing this for a very, very long time, multiple decades, showing me the reality of their results. That gave me a lot of confidence to say, well, this is actually real. This can really happen. And these people are actually doing it. Number two is looking at the data, meaning I looked up, you know, the, the Harvard review studies and the CBRE and the Marcus and Millichap and the CoStar and all this data about 2008, 9, 10, and then all these different real estate sectors and how they held up in recessions, historically speaking, that gave me a lot of confidence to pursue multifamily versus single family or other asset types like office, retail, hospitality, et cetera. Not bashing any of those other asset classes, but, but that's kind of what gave me the leap. Now, to answer the first part of your question, um, here's what I did. I got, I, I, got an, I think it was an Excel sheet and I said, okay, <laughs> this is the first time I got crystal clear on my net worth. I said, okay, if I sold all my single family homes, even if I sold the house I'm living in, if I sold everything and, and I paid the taxes and the realtor commissions and the fees and all of this, what do I have left over? What, what's actual cash in the bank? Now, now that I know that number approximately in theory, what if I start putting that to work in these syndications, 25K here, 50K there, 75K there? What could I conservatively achieve in terms of cash flow? That's really all I was focused on was cash flow because equity upside is anyone's guess. What is the Fed gonna do in five years? Don't know. Stimulus? Don't know. Unemployment benefits? Don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody has that crystal ball, but the cash flow you can look at multiple decades in history and see what a property has done in terms of cash flow and in terms of rents. It's a very slow moving machine. So I projected off 
the 8% rule is what I call it. I'm not recommending this to anybody. This is my take on it. As I said, I could probably achieve an 8% annualized cash flow. So here's how you run the numbers. You, you take, uh, let's just use a, a simple ben bench line number. You got a million bucks at 8% cash flow. You got $80,000 a year in passive income. You know, now, Will that equity upside be there and potentially even double that type of return? Maybe it's possible. And in my experience, it actually has happened that way. But I just don't count on it because I like to under promise and over deliver to myself. And that's a philosophy I look for in other uh, sponsorship groups when I'm doing an investment. So that that's my answer in a long winded nutshell. Um, and I remember we were talking about that backing into how much money do you need at yeah. what what's a safe conservative rate of return you can expect and then um, multiply that for you know divide it by 12 and how much you need per month so I I did that I watched the documentary the fire documentary that you recommended and you're right that it was all stocks uh, you know index funds and and I find even in the fire uh, Facebook groups and and Instagram um, influencers that I follow, they're very scared of real estate. So what do you have to say to our fellow fire people or just buy people uh, who, who tend to be a little bit afraid of real estate and maybe even afraid of a commercial syndication and maybe are stuck in, I don't want to say single family homes are stuck. I love them. They're pretty much set it and forget it, but not scalable. So what do you say to the people who are a little bit scared of real estate or avoiding it? Yeah, I, my biggest thing at the end of the day, uh, two things, invest in what you know and what makes sense to you, okay? For me, it's real estate in general. It was single family, that was my expertise at one point. It's now multifamily syndications. I study it, I, I network with people in it, right? I speak about it, I live it, I breathe it. This is my thing that I know the most about but that doesn't mean that anybody else in the world knows about it. And so some people may be experts at Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, stock market, day trading stocks. If that's your thing, man, all I ever did with all that stuff is lose money. So <laughs> it's clearly not my thing. <laughs> so that, that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing. Number two, what I always talk about on my podcast is it starts with self-education. What we're talking about right now, I applaud everybody for being here. I truly do from the bottom of my heart. I wish I would have done more stuff like this in 2009, 2010, because I wasn't surrounding myself with the right people. In fact, I wasn't really surrounding myself with people. <laughs> I was too busy working. And so it took me a long time to open my mind to this idea that this stuff actually exists. This is a real thing. And so you have to listen to podcasts. You have to read through financial news. You have to join real estate meetup groups and masterminds. I heard a couple of people talk about masterminds. Um, this is what you have to do to learn about these things, to open your mind to these possibilities. Otherwise, yeah, you're always skeptical and you think it's a scam. And I was guilty of this as well. Uh, when I first heard the word syndication, the first thing in my head was scam. It's got to be a scam. How could it be a scam? Why did I think that? I was doing single family houses and I knew my numbers. I knew my returns. I knew my cash flow. I knew my equity upside. And someone's handing me this deal or showing me this deal and saying, you know, you can get these kinds of returns off, off this multifamily stuff and you don't, you don't actually have to do the work. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, right. Are you kidding me? But, but the more I learned and the more I networked, the more I realized you're right. I actually, that, that's, that's actually a better thing for me, not to say it is for anybody else. So that was kind of the, the evolution of it. So uh, for me, uh, we decided how much we needed to retire on and the size of our pile of cash wasn't big enough for what mm -hmm. we need. And so we decided, uh, one, that my husband was going to keep his W2 for a little while longer yeah. and two, that I, I needed a job. Right. And so I, I love the point that you made about the beginning when you realized you were running a real estate business, you were not a real estate investor. Yeah. And that, I definitely agree with that because I feel like I run a real estate business. I'm not an investor, right? Even though all my, all my income through my business is technically passive income, I have to work pretty hard for it. So that kind of makes me think about the fact that I'm a real estate professional due to my business. 
Um, but passive losses only offset passive income. So can you talk to us a little bit about the tax implications of, because well, you're enjoying 100% passive income. So all the losses that you get through any of your investments are completely usable by you. Whereas most of us having derived our income from active income can't really use that. And so can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the tax benefits uh, that you're enjoying as a passive investor versus those of us who work for our money? Sure. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, for, for those that haven't watched it, you made a great video on this with, with Troy. And so check that out. I think it was on, I don't know, YouTube or maybe it was on your Facebook group. Oh my God, my Facebook group. Yeah. Okay, cool. It, it's uh, so you could be a real estate professional when you have active involvement in real estate, you know, a, a realtor or whatnot, just as one example. And so you can take these passive losses to potentially offset active income. And it's a more sophisticated conversation. I don't want to dive too deep into it. I'll probably say something wrong and I'm not a CPA or anything <laughs> like that. But basically, here's how it works. <clears throat> I go put, for example, $100,000 as a limited partner into an apartment syndication. What I'm going to get in terms of taxes is by March 31st, usually of the following year, I get a K-1 tax form. On the K-1 tax form, uh, there's going to be depreciation, which I think we're all familiar with in terms of just real estate, but it's better in a lot of cases in multifamily because you can do these cost segregations where you're segregating elements of the property. We have bonus and accelerated depreciation available to us right now in the tax code. So what I'm looking at on paper is I put a hundred grand into a deal and I have negative $40,000 in losses. Now, did I actually lose 40,000? I hope not, but <laughs> it's, it's just on paper, right? So I get to use that against my income, my cash flow and my dividends and my interest, my portfolio income, th things that I do as an investor. And so, the bottom line is, and by the way, these are all just example made up numbers, but it, it's similar to this, right? Every deal is going to be a little bit different and please seek legal tax advice and all that good stuff. But um, basically, I'm, I'm not paying any taxes up until the point of sale on a property because I have more losses than I have distributions. And then at the time of sale, I could choose if the operator offers it to do a 1031 exchange and kind of kick the can down the road, not pay taxes now. Or if I pay the taxes, I have long-term capital gains, which are highly tax advantaged. You know, for most people, that's going to be 15%. For some, it could be zero. And for the highest income earners, it could be 20. We'll see what this Biden administration does. Don't get me started on that. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's how it stands as of today. So it's a highly tax advantaged vehicle. And if you can become a real estate professional, uh, like you are, Emma, it, it's even better. It's, it's just, it's, the golden goose, you know, so look more into that. I'm not the expert on it, but yes, you can legally pay zero in taxes on this type of stuff if you do it right. And I'm sitting in a house right now that we paid for off of our tax refund. Boom. Gosh. This is the down living payment. example. Yeah. So, and then we're tearing in our other house into an assisted living facility. We could sell it, take that equity and then go put it in a syndication passively. But I feel like, um, there are some advantages to us doing that because it has some pretty good cash flow. Um, so it, it just gives you so many more, so many more options when you start thinking like, how can I, how can I maximize the cash flow? How much cash do I need invested? So we're counting that equity over there as part of our, part of our investment. Um, okay. So I want to open it up. Everybody go ahead. If you have some questions, I'm going to open up these questions from Facebook and read those to you. But um, while I'm grabbing those, if somebody wants to holler at Travis, uh, Tra uh, Jeremiah Leonard, go for it. How's it going? Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Jeremiah. Yes, I can. Fantastic. Let me throw my camera back on. Thank you, Travis, so much. That was an awesome presentation. I think I've heard of you on Bigger Pockets before, but now I'm on your Instagram, so I'll definitely hear about you again. Uh, my sort of question, I don't know if you heard my intro, but I'm pretty new to this. I just bought my first house. I'm sitting in it right now. We're thinking of house hacking. The bottom is an Airbnb potentially, which would be awesome. But I've always been way more interested in multifamily than single family. And living in Salt Lake City, that's something that's kind of hard to come by. Mm -hmm. You've been talking about syndication. I've heard about it. I'm not super familiar with it, but it seems like something I'll eventually be interested in. 
I've had my W2 for coming up on three years right now. I'm making way more money than I should, and I'm putting it all in a little stockpile. So I have a nice nest egg. I'm interested in the syndication sort of stuff, but I'm kind of unfamiliar with how it works. So can you kind of jump into that? And then if it's something I'm interested in, I'll go onto your calendar, put in 15 minutes, and maybe we can talk more. Sure. Yeah, happy to. And and apologies to everybody. <laughs> the, the the main topic here is is apartment syndications, and yet there wasn't even a slide on what this even means. So <laughs> let me break it down this way. You can um, add that later. I'm sorry, what's that? You can add that slide later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. It's, I got so many presentations, and I didn't even look through all this one. But anyway, uh, okay, so let's look at it this way. So you've got a... Um, You've got general partners and limited partners. The general partners or the sponsorship team or the co-GPs, these are the people who are finding these properties uh, either off market or through MLS or through realtor broker connections. They're finding, let's, let's call it for example purposes, a 400 unit apartment building in Dallas, Texas. Okay, well that apartment building might be $80 million. So not everybody has that kind of cash laying around, or I should say 30% of that, which would be your, your down payment plus your rehab budget. So what you do as a general partner is you raise the capital to fund that deal. So you find people like myself and 100 or 200 other people who are willing to put 25,000, 50,000, 75,000, et cetera, into this deal. And these could be structured as a limited partnership, as an LP, or it could be structured just as an LLC where you have interest ownership in it. And so you're basically creating an entity that's gonna own this property. And then when I put, let's say I put $100,000 into it as an investor, I might be a 1% owner of that apartment building. And so then we're gonna share between the general partners and the limited partners and the cash flow and the revenue generating items, the upside. And, and of course there's fees and there's splits and you know, I'm not gonna get into all the details right now on that, but basically the bottom line is what I might expect reasonably as a limited partner is, I don't know, seven to 10% cash flow, let's say on an annualized basis, somewhere in that range maybe. And then as we go to sell the property, Later, if we did the business plan correctly, and I keep saying we, I'm not doing anything as a limited partner, but if the general partner executes the business strategy and things work out and the economy is all good, then we sell at a profit and then we split those proceeds. And so what I might end up with at the end of the day is like maybe a 15% annualized return. If I factor the cash flow I got plus the equity and I kind of divide that equity on the back end how many years we held the property, something like this. Okay, just for example purposes. So that's what a syndication is. It's private, so it's not on the stock market. And that's why these are illiquid shares as I pointed out. So when I go put that hundred in the deal, I'm handing it over to the team and that money is gonna be used and tied up in illiquid for three, five, seven years. It just depends on the business model. So some syndicators do funds where they might put five or six or seven properties under a fund umbrella and some just do individual deals and say, here's our 400 unit apartment building. Do you want to take part in it? So that's syndication in a nutshell. Hopefully that makes sense. Totally does. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll let other people ask questions, but I'll definitely uh, follow up with you on your calendar. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeremiah. I've got um, one question here, and if the next person wants to uh, ask a question, we're going to do this one, and then we'll turn it back into the room. So AJ Hu on Facebook says, uh, what specific points do you emphasize to a potential investor when talking to them about investing? And I, I love this question because I think in this group in particular, we have a nice cross-section of very new investors, new passive investors who want to be passive, and those who are active investors looking on how to attract capital and so we're talking to the to the passive investor but as an active investor you need to be listening and saying these are the questions that my potential passive investors are going to ask and this is the stuff that i need to understand and i need to be able to explain it to them in a way that is simple without over complicating things because sometimes when you have a deep knowledge of something um you go into too much detail and, and, and they get lost and if they're confused they're not going to invest with you so what AJ says, what specific points do you emphasize to potential investors when talking to them about investing? 
Yeah, good point. I always kind of get back to these these three categories of risk when you're doing an apartment syndication deal. Okay, it's going to be the sponsorship team, the general partner, the market that you're investing in, and the deal itself. So I usually kind of default to to talking about these three items and really how to vet a, a sponsor, how to vet a market, how to vet a deal. And I like to really rely on data, like factual data that I can share with people about where people are, are moving out of, where people are moving to, migration trends, uh, tax-friendly states, uh, business-friendly states, landlord-tenant laws. Uh, this is all just data that I can share without getting involved with analysis paralysis. The reason I actually launched my Bigger Pockets blog and my Actively Passive show on YouTube is because I talk about these specific points in great detail so that I only have 15 minutes on these calls. I can't always, I mean, talking about how to vet a market, I think that episode's like 45 minutes long. You know, that'd be the entire, that'd be three calls. So I, I make all this content to share with people how I go about doing that. So definitely check out those channels. I'm not saying that just to self-promote. I have nothing to sell, but that's that's uh -oh. where my content is. And um, just recognize those are your three areas of risk. And real quick, if I had to put a weighted percentage to these three, I'd say it's 50% of importance to vet out the sponsorship team, their track record, their experience, that kind of stuff. Then 25%, the market, obviously very important, but not the end all be all. There's still good deals in Ada, Oklahoma, believe it or not. And then the last thing would be the deal itself. Obviously, a, a lot of people, myself included, that are newer, get all caught up in the deal. You know, it's all about crunching numbers and the T12s and T3s and the underwriting and the three mile radius and the incomes and the cap rates. But really, if you're working with an experienced operator, th they know what they're doing. You know, you still got to double check them and you still got to run the numbers, but you don't have to be an expert because you're deferring it to the experts. Anybody have a question they want to jump in with? And then I've got one more here on Facebook. All right. Um, so there are actually two more on Facebook. One should be pretty quick. Um, and the other should take longer. So the short one is if you want to sell your limited partnership shares, uh, is there a market out there for that? If you don't want your cash tied up that long or you have some some reason that you need to get it out early? Good question. So every deal, every private placement deal is going to have what's called a PPM, a private placement memorandum, which is going in an operating agreement is, is part of this. And so it's going to outline how that actually works, depending on that particular group's process. But I'll give you a high level example, not talk about any particular groups here, but this is generally what it is. So I own, let's say I put in $50,000 into a LP deal, two years later, I say, you know what? I really kind of need that money for whatever. Okay, I, I could facilitate having somebody buy out my shares and they could take over my position they could just basically wire me 50,000 and then now they change the registration name and now that person owns my shares. You can self facilitate that way uh, in most cases. You can also reach out to the general partner and most of them are willing to work with you. So they'll maybe send an email out to some of their heavy hitter investors or someone else that's already in that deal as a limited partner, and they'll say, hey, are you interested in maybe adding another 50K to your position? Somebody's looking to exit. And, you know, in a matter of sense, they can help facilitate that, you know, following the, the legalities around that, that situation. But the bottom line is it isn't something where you get your money back, but have to take a penalty or, or you get redemption. It could be structured that way, by the way. I shouldn't just eliminate that as a possibility. If you're in some kind of fund and they offer uh, liquidity after, say, 90 days or a couple of years or something, um, that may be the case. But most are illiquid. And so just know that it'd be like anything else out there in the in the world that you own shares in like a private company or something. It's, well, what is it worth? I don't know. Maybe you have to sell it for less than what you put in or Maybe you get lucky and you sell it at a premium. You say, look, this is only a three-year business plan. We're already two years into it. 
So I put in 50, why don't you buy my shares for 60K? You know, but most of the time it's the LP investor having to negotiate terms themselves with the potential buyer of their shares. So don't think it's impossible to get out, but never set the expectation that, you know, don't, don't invest if you're gonna need the money basically, <laughs> or if you think there's a probability that, that you might. And I, I met a guy uh, at a conference who was just buying up LPs as his business model. He'd go around and say, do you want out of your LP? I'll buy it. And, and he was buying at a discount for what the future value was, but it was still more than what they put in. Like you said, they put in 50 grand after a couple of years, he'd buy it for 75, but then he'd make, I don't know, 150 or 200 off of it. So he's, he, everybody walked away happy in, in that situation. So there are, there are options. And sometimes we do the other way around we'll have somebody reach out to us and say, hey, uh, do you still need any money in this deal? And say, no, we're fully funded, so we legally cannot accept more, but we will reach out to our limited partners and say, hey, somebody wants in for 50 grand or 100 grand, does anybody want to exit a portion? And you know, somebody will say, I can do up to 100 grand or something. Um, and so that's always a possibility. Just keep the dialogue open with the operators, which is one reason I like working with uh, an operator that has a good team of customer service so you can have that communication going. I do as well, thanks for pointing that out. Um, and then somebody says, if you had to start all over again, knowing what you know now, let's say you lost everything and you had to start all over, what, what would be your path now versus the way it was uh, your first time around? I still resort back to this. I'd go back to, you know, high income paying job, active real estate investing, probably side businesses, whatever I could do in, in that regard, I would live below my means for a period of time and I would still be in real estate, you know, through 2021, uh, cash flow focus, but also equity, especially in the beginning, probably more equity upside and not getting into debt. I mean, it, it really does get back to simple, but not easy. That was my path. And I think it's the tried and true. So that's what I would do. Nice. I agree. And like I said, my, my high paying job is a real estate business. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. It's, it's your highest and best. So there you go. That yep. can work. So does anybody have any questions for Travis before we wrap? I have a few questions for you, Travis. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts about college? Because college obviously helps you get higher paying jobs, but then obviously there's a lot of debt attached to that. Yeah, the way I look, that's, a, that's an excellent, and I wrote a long, long blog on this actually about some life hacks. I think it's on, that's my bigger pockets uh, channel, but uh, check that out. But here's my general thoughts. I look at college as an investment. So I say, okay, I put in, I don't know, I'm just making these numbers up. I put in $100,000 toward tuition for some four year degree. What's the realistic outcome on the other side of that, right? I, I come away with a job that pays me, I don't know, 75,000 a year, then I have to pay taxes. So really that's more like 50. And then, you know, I have living expenses. So, you know, I, I look at it that way as kind of an ROI or return on investment. So when I went to college, I was dead set on not accumulating debt. I was not going to take on debt. And if it meant I wasn't going to college, that's what it meant. Not to say it's right for anyone else, but that was my thing. So I got a, a, a partial scholarship that more or less funded my first two years. And I had to stay in state and I ended up choosing a um, uh, like a junior college, basically. And I got an associate's degree in what I thought I was passionate about at the time, which was live show production and audio and video and film and stuff like that. And uh, went to go do my internship and realized I really don't like this. This isn't really what I thought this was going to be about. And, and so I never actually used my degree uh, besides renting out audio equipment, I guess. I knew a little bit about that. But other than that, you know, but I was fortunate not to have to take on that kind of debt. So I would say be, be super aware of the consequences of that. Um, you know, even though there's a lot of talk about forgiving student loan debt and that interest rates are really low and that it's subsidized by the government and all this stuff, it's still a big crutch for a lot of folks. And so if you have it already, focus on paying it off. That's that's my approach. That's my opinion. If you don't have it, I just had this conversation with my nephews a year ago who were at, at that age. And it's like, 
be crystal clear on what you want. Be, be, you know, go intern if you can before you go to college. Understand what this profession is really about. And ideally, you, you really want to have a passion for what you're doing. If you want to go be a doctor, you, you better be damn sure you want to be a doctor before you go put 300K on the line and then go, well, I really don't like being a doctor. Um, <laughs> let's go yeah, make not to mention the time. Yeah. Some general thoughts. It would be cost as well. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's that? The opportunity cost as well, spending that time paying somebody else versus getting paid is, is also a factor. It is. Sure. It is. That was another blog I wrote. I, I used this example and I, I put out all the math. I said, what if you, what if you just had just an imaginary land here? What if you had 50K and you said, I'm either going to spend this on college or I'm going to become an investor and put that to work at 8% what's the outcome after like 20, 30 years? Pretty interesting uh, to take a look at that. FYI. I'll definitely take a look. Um, last thing really quick, I think you mentioned maybe Emma, the fire documentary. What is that called? How could I find that? That was one Travis told me about during our call and we just bought it off YouTube for like seven bucks. Um, maybe you and Ryan should come over and <laughs> we'll watch it on our- Yeah, See, that sounds good. Where the TV is supposed to go. It's coming <laughs> this week. Um, yeah, it's a, it's just a, it's a story of one family's journey of basically saving 50% of their income. They're living in Coronado in uh, San Diego, one of the most expensive uh, markets in the world and how they decided they wanted to retire early and bought, moved in with their parents, kind of figure out what they were going to do. And, and that whole journey where what Travis was talking about, it's like, people don't understand it. They're like, well, why would you want to retire early? What on earth are you going to do with your time? And so just some figuring out their lives, figuring out their goals. And it wasn't long after that, that, that I, I decided like, this is, this is really what we're going to do. I'd already decided, but like, this is really what we're going to do. And I actually started an Instagram channel about our passive income adventures. It's a photo journal of fun stuff that we do as we're getting ready to uh, retire or at least be work optional. So that as I'm raising capital for my deals from passive investors, I'm saying like, I get it. I'm there with you. I'm passively investing. I'm working towards the same thing that you are. Plus, you know, all the fun stuff that you can do when you don't have to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. Anything for freedom. That's what it's all about for me. Yep. And I, I love the documentary that my kids were able to, to kind of, some of them were in and out. Some of them sat down and watched it with us because your, your college question, I think goes back to it. Like, what are we, what are we teaching our kids? What are we teaching our nieces and nephews or grandkids? Uh, even if we're past that stage in our lives. And I'll, I'll give you the same advice I gave my kids that you know, when Ryan and I talk about it, if you are going to go do something, do it in the cheapest way possible. If you want to be a software developer, go like what Ryan did, go get a certificate. He didn't go to college and now he's making a pretty good income, saving it and getting house hacking. My daughter wants to be an engineer. She has to have an engineering degree. So I said, well, this is she's passionate about it she's wanted to do this since she's 14 she's 22 now she's almost in her senior year still loves it uh, i said well how are you going to get this as cheaply as possible this is an investment in your career you're not going to go out and just go willy-nilly crazy spending student loan money because because it's there uh, mm -hmm. you, it's just like when you're buying a car you could buy a porsche or you could buy a ferrari but you can afford a honda so go buy a honda so she went to a honda type of college paid her tuition there my other daughter doesn't really want to go to college. She wants to be a full-time investor. And I'm giving her the opposite advice. With coronavirus, her, my daughter's engineering degree went from having two to three classes online to being 100% online overnight. So a girl who was stuck on campus for how many years it was going to take suddenly can now go wherever she wants and finish her engineering degree online for a pretty reasonable price. So the landscape has changed. So I told my 17-year-old, you don't have to go to college, go house hack, go be a real estate investor, you know, work at Sonic. We don't care. Just save your money and, and start investing. I said, but there's no reason for you not to go to college. Really? It's so cheap. You take one class online at a time. It might take you 10 years, but those 10 years are going to pass anyway. You might as well pass it working on a degree, go mm -hmm. live on campus like what Ryan does so he can enjoy the social life of the other college students. So this is the stuff that we're teaching our kids. So that they don't have to start, you know, at, at 40, like I did. <laughs> yeah. When I was listening, sorry, I'm taking up so much time. But when I was listening to your bigger pockets, 
I remember liking you because of what you were saying about real estate, but I remember thinking, man, this chick is like exactly where I want to end up because of how you were talking about how you were teaching your kids and how you were helping others. And so I think that's a really cool thing that kids are getting in our generation that you guys didn't get is being taught young about these cool hacks of life. Yeah. Can you like come over and tell my kids that? And my niece just, <laughs> Peyton is uh, Ryan's cousin, just dropped in. I, I feel like, like my, my, my siblings don't want to listen to any of this. Their kids are asking me lots of questions. And my kids are like, shut up, mom. It's just like what you said, Travis. <laughs> Your family are tired of hearing about Can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So anyway, um, great discussion tonight, you guys. I think this was this is really valuable. Like I said, if you're passive, how to set those goals, how to figure out how much money you need. And if you're active, how do you talk to people? I'll, I'll end with, with one story. A friend of mine was telling me recently, somebody sold a company and had a huge, huge chunk of cash. And he was telling him, oh, we should go out and buy some duplexes and, and you could do this and you could quit your job and, and retire early or whatever. And the guy was like, no, no, I love my job. I love my company. I feel like we are working on a mission. I feel like I'm really contributing to the world. I have no desire to go retire. I don't I want anything to do with real estate. I don't care about it. So he's trying to talk to his passive investor according to his own goals and not talking to the passive investor in that investor's language, which is... Think of all the good that you can do with this cash. Let's go do an affordable housing development. Let's go invest in some sort of an office complex or, or just really listening to what this guy was wanting to do with this money and then being able to talk to him in his own language. So when you're talking to your passive investors, think how they're thinking, find out what's important to them and be able to explain it in a way that makes sense to them. And that's what I hope we all are getting from both ends of this, of this meeting tonight. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing. Thank you guys so much for the questions. All right. We will see you next month. Our speaker is Himal Badiani. I met Himal just under a year ago, 11 months ago, and he had not done a deal. And over the course of the last 10 months, he now has something like 1200 units. He's an expert at using private equity firms instead of um, syndication through the, the mom and pop syndication, I guess you could say, raising it a dollar at a time. And so he's He's definitely raising money in a different way than most of us are. And so he's going to come tell us how he scaled that quickly in such a short period of time, how he met the people, how he found the deals and how he met um, the firms that, and the funds that are investing in his deals. So we'll do that next month. And then in March, I have invited on my mortgage lender that I was mentioning in that video that I made where he's going to teach us basically how to look at our taxes, what our taxes need to look like before we file them in April. So he'll be on the end of March and teach you what you need to go to your mortgage lender and ask like, here are my taxes. We've tried to maximize this to get, to pay as low as possible, to have the lowest uh, earned income possible, but I still wanna be able to get a mortgage. And so he'll help you work through that process so you can have the best of both worlds. So I'll see you next month in February and March, and then I'll continue to announce our guests. Uh, if you know of anybody who you would like to have on as a guest, like Travis was by request, um, or you would like to be a guest, let me know because I'm planning out a q2 right now so thanks everybody for coming thank, thank you, you. all right thanks, thanks travis so much yeah. I appreciate you bet